there. All right. Thank you, Lord. All right, so we are going to pick off where we left uh, off. And we've been going through this teaching now. This will be the fourth one. This will be the final one. Uh, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. All right, is that good teaching, guys? Oh, yeah. Is there, any, is there anything else? All right, it's the Word of God. It's Jesus' teachings. Um, and they're so vital to our faith. And we really do need to get back to abiding in them, living in them, allowing them to permeate us. Uh, and things that we say now, especially in this culture, well, that's kind of been thrown out, or we don't need to follow that anymore. Well, no, we need to get back to what our Messiah said, what Jesus said. And if we stay in it, we're going to learn today what the Lord says we will be like and who we will be like. So last week we had gone through and we were just looking at the speck. We were looking at the Lord talking about judgment, right? And we were breaking that down. Just to remind everybody real quick, all these teachings we put on YouTube uh, for you to catch up on if you missed one or if you want to listen to one again. But I will encourage you to check out the YouTube channel because it's not just this church. We have a church in New York. We have a church in Houston, Texas. And we have some great teachers, great leaders in that place. And we believe this is one of the greatest forms of evangelism, if you want to say, for the end of the age is through technology. So we record all the different messages and we put them up in there and there's the whole Bible school and there's many other things on there. So if you just go on YouTube, look up Banner of Love Ministries, you will find all that and you will be blessed. Okay, so I encourage you to do that. So last week we ended off, I believe, before we got into the Lord talking us, uh, teaching us, excuse me, about asking, right, about seeking mm -hmm. and about knocking. Okay, uh, and we're going to jump in there today. Now, the context is the Lord just came talking about, right, judgment and the standard of measure and the standard of measure that we use upon others. Will it be measured back to us? So if we measure out unforgiveness, how will it be measured back to us? If we measure out, yeah, likewise, if we measure out wrath and condemnation and can we very easily, uh, the Lord says, that he is the judge, but can we want to be the judge and say, heaven, hell, this person's damned, this person saved. How much more so, uh, let's take like the story of Nebuchadnezzar, a man who mass murdered millions of people at the end of the day, and at the end of his life, did he come to know the Lord? Seems so. Seems so. If we were God, would we allow that to happen? <laughs> no way. One honest man. Probably not. We'd want to see him get his comeuppance, wouldn't we? That's our heart. But through Christ, our heart is renewed, our heart is restored, and then we can see clearly. Remember what the Lord says, before you go take it out of your brother's eye, what do you first need to do? Go to Specsavers. Yeah, go to Specsavers, that's right. <laughs> you need to see clearly. Because if you don't see clearly, what are you going to do to your brother? You're going to damage them. You're going to hurt them. Now again, context is so important. Who is Jesus addressing this to? The world? Unbelievers? No, no his followers. People who believe in Yahweh, God, or people who believe in Jesus. So if you are of that crowd, this applies to you. So the Lord then continues on. And we talked about, right, casting your pearls before swine and wisdom in that. But then the Lord tells us something that we can all probably rattle off by heart, right? Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks... It will be opened, right? Okay, so we all know this. Now let's just continue reading, and we're going to jump over to Luke in a minute. Or what man is there among you that when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil... All right, here we go. Pause button. Are you ready for the pause button here? What does the Lord say we are? Everybody say it. Evil. Is mankind good or mankind evil? evil. This goes contrary to what the world says. This goes contrary to now what the church is teaching. The reality is without the saving grace of Jesus Christ, mankind is evil. And that is a foundational block because if we want to say, well, you know what? Mankind is good. Why do we need Jesus? Why do we need a savior? If we're good, then I can do enough good works and I can be a good person and I can Put on the show and get into heaven. But the Lord, very clearly, I love what he says uh, to your man, the rich young ruler as we coin him, right? 
Why do you call me good? Nobody is good except for God alone. So can we be good? Can we be good, guys? Yeah, we're being made good. We're being made holy. We're being made perfect. Because as we receive Christ and his teachings, as we receive the Holy Spirit, as we walk by the Holy Spirit, as we obey his commands, what happens to us? Do you keep doing all the evil things you used to do? If you are, there's a problem. Then we haven't truly received it. But if we truly have received it, has anyone noticed there's a change in your life? The things you used to say, you no longer say. The actions you used to do, you no longer do. The ways that you used to respond maybe in a situation. Everybody have that proverbial button? When somebody presses it, you want to rip their head off? You might still have a few of them. (laughs) And if we have those buttons, what does it mean? We haven't given that area to Jesus. And we need the Lord to come into that area and what? Bring his goodness into that area. Okay, and as he is good and we receive his goodness, we become good. All right, it's not based upon our own effort that I did X amount of good deeds. I did 100 good deeds, 99 bad deeds. I get into heaven. That's works theology, works doctrine, and it's absolute rubbish. Now, does your faith produce good deeds, good works, good actions? Yes. And is it proof that you actually are a follower of Jesus? We're going to read it in a minute. Jesus talks about fruit, all right? So the Lord says, us being evil, so do we understand mankind is evil? But even in our evilness, do we still show kindness to our children? Not all, but, but a lot do, right? And he says, if you being evil, right? Uh, let's see. Know how to give good gifts to your children. Everybody say, how much more? How much more? I love that line. All right, the Lord Jesus uses that line. Paul uses that line. Peter uses it. How much more? Okay. Will your Father who is in heaven give you, right? Give what is good to those who ask him. And everything, therefore, treat people the same way uh, you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. In this, this sums up the whole law and the prophets. What is the first greatest commandment? As the Lord said, the greatest one, love the Lord. He takes us back to Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, okay? Yeah, and you should love the Lord your God with everything. But then if we go to Leviticus, what's the second greatest one? You shall love your... Who's your neighbor? <laughs> Turn to your neighbor again and say, I love you. <laughs> might be easy if it's your spouse. Maybe it's somebody uh, you have a hard time loving. Now, does it mean that uh, we're best friends with everybody and everything's rosy? Do we have issues, guys? We do. We do. <laughs> but do we love one another as Christ has loved us? Are you willing to lay down your life for the person next to you? Are you willing to? Would you be willing to? Ask yourself that question. I hope so. Now, if it's your, your husband or your wife or your kid, you might say, oh, absolutely. But if it's that person that annoys you in church, are you willing to lay down your life for them? <laughs> I hope so. No, have no greater love than this, than his, what, friend would lay down, sorry, than a man would lay down his life for his, his friends. Are we all members of God's household if we've received that? So we need to think of others more highly than we think of ourselves, Right? So it says here, let's jump in really quick. The Lord wants us to ask. Do you remember the last couple of weeks we've been going through and it says, before, the, before we even ask, the Father knows what we stand in need of. It also says that all the things we need, He already knows. Amen. So why does He want us to ask? Why does He want us to ask, guys? Why? It's good for us. It's good for Him. It's good for our relationship because God is not up there and we're down here and he's God and we're all the little ants. Did God create us? Whose image are you created in? This is why evolution is so wicked and so evil. Okay, because it says, oh, we came from animals. No, we did not. We were created in our father's image, the image of God. Now, we need to receive that adoption. We need to come into that because we've been separated by sin. 
But once we've come into that, I don't know about you, does that give you great identity? Amen. Knowing that you are created in the image of the creator. I love reading the story of Moses. And what does it say? Moses is there and the Lord passed in front of Moses. And the Lord allowed him to see right his back. But what's the, what's the implication? Who does, who does Moses look like? Like his father. Like God. God comes down and walks. In the, and in the garden, what did it say? He walked in the cool of the day. So your toes and your fingers and everything else, why do we have them all? Who looks like us? Our Father, God. And if we get that, is there a great uh, identity that we receive in that and it shatters that insecurity? It shatters that uh, perception of, oh, well, I'm just me and God's up there. And uh, No. He wants that intimacy with us and he tells us to ask. I've told you many times, my son comes to me all the time and asks. <laughs> He's very good at asking. Okay? And just like I, I think I said it last week, at lunchtime, he comes at noon and he says, Dad, I'm hungry. And I know he's going to do it. And sometimes beforehand, I'll have the lunch ready. Just like our father, does he know what we stand in need of? So when we come and ask, are there times he has it right there and he says, I know, here you go. Are there other times he says, okay, sit down, wait. <laughs> Are there other times, can God say no? James tells us that if we ask, we need to ask in faith. And if we ask with doubt, we are like a man who's tossed back and forth. And then he goes on to say that we can even ask, but if our motives are not correct, we will not receive it. Can we ask with wrong intent? Can you have selfish ambition when you ask God for something? <laughs> could you say you know what well i want to be the pastor of the church so let me get that gift in god but you have a brokenness in your heart and you just want attention is there a problem there could you be called to be a pastor absolutely but could there be a major brokenness there and could it really hurt you and hurt other people as well so the lord says nope that's not going to happen and he withholds until we are healed and restored in all these things so the lord wants us to ask and just like he says, really quick, that last line, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. This is the summing of, right, the law and the prophets. So would you spit on somebody? Would you punch somebody? Would you curse somebody out? I hope not. Okay? Because that's not supposed to be in us as believers. So the way we treat others is the way that it's supposed to happen. The way we treat ourselves and then others, this respect mutual respect for one another remember this whole teaching stems from that uh what rachel started with we've been talking about christian etiquette and conduct how we are supposed to act in the household of god all right so who here gets angry <laughs> who here has sinned in their anger who here has sinned by their mouth in their anger we're going more detailed the things that came out of your mouth in your anger, what if somebody said them to you, how would you feel? We've got to flip it, don't we? Because we're very good at sowing them and throwing them at other people. But then when somebody says them against us, we go, oh, don't, that's so. But you did the exact same thing. Do we have an issue? It's called hypocrisy. And the things that we sow, very clearly the scriptures say, will we reap them? Did the Lord just talk about judgment and the way that we judge Others, the Lord will then, by that standard, measure it back to us. So how should we treat our fellow neighbor with mercy, with love, with compassion, caring for them, helping them, being there for them, okay? And how much more so in our families, with our children, and how much more so, as the scriptures say, in the household of God? That if we don't conduct ourselves here, guys, if we're all biting each other and devouring each other and we're saying we're Christians, what kind of witness is that to the world? It's a miserable one, I'll be honest with you. And I'll tell you right now, who's ever been called out by the world? I thought you were a Christian. Anyone ever had that said to you? And maybe they're just being a jerk. And that's, you have to leave them with the Lord. But maybe we sinned. We said the wrong thing. We acted the wrong way. Maybe we got drunk. Maybe we let out some words out of our mouth that should not be on a believer's tongue. 
Maybe we even went against the commands of the Lord and they know, oh, wait a minute, that's one of the Ten Commandments and they point it out to you. Are you humble enough to say, well, yeah, you know what, I did sin. Forgive me for that. You know what that would do to an unbeliever? That'd shock them. <laughs> They're not used to that. And then prove, as the Scriptures say, through our character, through our actions, that we are truly sons of God. So in Luke eleven five, 5, we get the same account. But we get a different, uh, just a little bit different uh, telling. And we have a parable added into this one. And it says, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut. My children are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Now, come on, especially if you got the kids to sleep. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> You're going to wake them up, right? But your man, what does he keep doing? I need the bread. These visitors have come from Africa. They're all the way here, and I need to feed them, whatever it may be, right? And it says, yet because of this man's persistence, right? He will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek. So the same thing. Now, the very important thing here, I didn't go into all the Greek. I could have got it all. But uh, in the original translation, and most of our Bibles don't translate it this way, and it's actually a poor translation at the end of the day. Do you know what it actually says? What I have in yellow. It says, keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. That is the way it is actually translated in the original text. Does that change it a little bit? Because what was the parable the Lord just gave us? What did your man do? Did he knock once and go, no, I won't give it to you. Okay, bye. And did he go away? Or did he know his friend? Did he have a relationship with his friend? And did he know if he kept knocking, if I went to Jim's door and I kept knocking on it, and maybe he's asleep, he's like, ah, go away, I'll talk to you tomorrow. But if I kept knocking, Jim, would you eventually open the door? <laughs> he might come to the door with a gun <laughs> I think Jim eventually would give me some spuds <laughs> you know, he'd give me some eggs <laughs> or he might throw them at me <laughs> now eventually Jim would you come and open the door because we're friends right and we have that relationship and say okay yeah alright here you go whatever you need I will help you so the amazing thing is the Lord wants us to be persistent okay because that is relationship, guys. All right? With people that you love, whether it be your husband, your wife, your kids, uh, friends, people in this place, whatever it may be, are you persistent in relationship with them? Are you talking to them? Are you constantly going after it? And I'll say in marriage, one of the greatest things you do need is persistence. All right? Uh, in order for my wife to be wooed by me, do I need to continually love her and chase after her? And could I lax off one? Could I, could I lax off? Take her on dates, absolutely. All right, yeah, come on. How many people, unfortunately, married and they don't go on dates anymore, right? Because that's a bygone thing. Oh, we did that when we were young. But should we continually be doing these things? Amen. All right, do we see it in the scriptures that the, the couples that truly loved each other, uh, if we went to Song of Solomon and read what Solomon had to write on the matter, is there a consistent pursuing? There is. Can we read King David? It is, yeah, in the Psalms. Do we see this as well? We do. So, is the Lord pursuing us? He is. he is. He's in love with us. He's jealous for us, is what the scriptures say. And if we aren't jealous for him, there's a big problem, isn't there? And over and over again, when the Lord's jealousy is aroused in the scriptures, it doesn't end well, guys. Because we're supposed to be his. But then if we go out and commit sp spiritual adultery, as the scriptures say, we chase after idolatry or even this world or all this stuff, the Lord's jealousy is aroused against us. But his desire is for us, not against us. His desire is that we would come. And what does he want us to do? Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Now, the context in Luke is a little bit different. And we get a little more detail. It's very important. So he gives us the same thing. But then he says in verse 13, If you then being evil, so we already had this, know how to good give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who 
Ask him. What is the greatest gift that we will ever receive? The Holy Spirit. God. There's many things we could. The cross. All right. His grace. There's many things we could lump in there. Right. But the presence of God. Does the living God of all creation want to dwell in this place? Does he want to dwell with us and within us? Does he want to? What does it say? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And anyone who, what do they have to do? They have to open the door. It actually says Jesus. He's speaking. They have to hear his voice. Open the door and let him in. And what does the Lord want to do with us? Rebuke you. He wants to tell you all the things you've ever done wrong. Now, does he discipline those he loves? He does. And if you're acting the maggot, will the Lord correct you? Oh, he will. But why does he want to come in? He wants to dine. He wants to dine with us. What is that picture? Is that intimacy? Is that love? That the Savior of the world wants to have that intimate fellowship with us. We could go to John 14, 15, 16, 17. What's it all about? Abiding. Abiding. Remain in me. Abide in me. Do we have to choose that, guys? And I want to tell you right now, you have to fight for that. Because there are so many things in this world that are saying, come over here and ask for me. Come over here. What did we just sing? The first song we sung. It's all about, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? And we will not bow down to the gods of men. Do you know there are many things seeking your attention? Do you know that, guys? And do you know you can go seeking after them? If you aren't seeking for the Lord, you will be seeking for something. There is just this reality that the Lord has made us, uh, actually because, let's say, of the effect of the curse, sin and death. Do you know what's inside of us? A giant hole, a chasm. That can only be fixed and filled and remedied with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. But do you know people that don't know Jesus? You know what they do? They have to try to fill that chasm. They have to try to fill that hole because they realize there's something I'm lacking. So very easily what comes in? Drugs, alcohol, sin, sexual sin, lust. What else? Greed. How many Christians are controlled by greed at the end of the day? That, you know what, if I have it, coveting, if I have it, that one nice thing, that house, that car, the job, the finances, the money, if I have that, I will finally be happy. And do you know what happens? They go for the next one. And they go for the next one. And guess what? They're never happy. Why is it one of the saddest things, and it's just a reality, of actors and musicians who have millions, if not billions, how many times a year do you see in the news what happens to them? Suicide, drug overdose, whatever it may be. They've got it all by our standards, by the world's standards. And they are the most miserable people you could ever meet. They've tried it all. They've done everything under the sun. And they are not content because the only thing that fills that void is Jesus, our Messiah. And he wants us to come. And what does he say? Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. So as Paul says, we are in a fight. We are running a race. So do we need to continually come to him, guys? Do you need to continually, every day, as the Lord taught us to pray, do you need to cry out and pray to God? Do you need to continually, daily, be in his word? Do you need to continually, daily, worship the King of kings and Lord of lords? You do. Because he is worthy. And as you do that, I guarantee you, your life will be flipped upside down, but it will change and you will have fulfillment. You will overcome this world because Jesus, did he overcome this world? Come on, guys. Did Jesus overcome this world? Did Pilate win? Did the Jews win? Did they keep him in the grave and did he not come out? Did Satan conquer him? No. He came up out of that grave. He conquered sin and death. And where is Jesus right now? We read it this morning. My Lord said to my Lord, where is he? Sitting at the right hand of the Father until his enemies, right, are made, are conquered. Absolutely a stool for him. So a beautiful thing. So the Lord, he wants us to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And what is the main thing he wants us to ask him for? His spirit. More of him. Absolutely. More of who he is in our lives. And we need to learn to stay in that place. The Lord then continues on. We'll jump back to Matthew 7. 
enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. These are hard verses, guys. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me, Jesus. So what is the only way into eternal life, into heaven, to be where the Father is? What right now is being said all over the world and unfortunately in the church as well? There are other ways besides Jesus. And it's absolute apostasy. Because if we start to go down that road, nobody can be saved. If we start to say there are other ways besides Jesus, or there's massive ministries and ministers that say, well, Jesus will find you on many paths. Jesus is in all the other religions. And we all come together and we'll sing Kumbaya and all this rubbish. Jesus is the only way. And if we stop preaching that message, you will lose your salvation. But anybody you then go to, can they be saved? All right, I'm a pastor. Could it be very easy for me? You know, this church, we could blow out the doors right now if I started to compromise teaching this. And I actually started to say, you know what? There are many ways. You can follow Buddha. You can follow Allah. You can follow uh, Shiva. All the different gods. You can be an atheist. And this is what all the major world religions are saying right now. The major movements in Catholic and Protestant church are doing the exact same thing. And it's absolutely heartbreaking because if we go down that road, first of all, I will have to give an account to the Lord. And then will I mislead the flock? Absolutely. And the flock will go out and what will they say? Come on. And then this place will blow out the doors. But there won't be... Barring a miracle from the Lord, would there any be anyone saved in this room if you all believe that message? No, because the only way is through, what did Jesus just teach us? Wide and broad is the gate that leads to destruction. At the end of the age, the Lord warned us, what would there be? Apostasy, heresy, evil doctrines of demons. And he said they'd be tickling the ears. Because does it sound nice? All right, everybody put up your hand. <laughs> Oh, I'm setting you up. All of us have unsaved family and friends. All of us do. It's a fact. And we have to confront ourselves with that. And do you know what the easiest thing to do in that place? Everybody eventually is going to be saved. And we take verses, and this is what everyone does nowadays, like in John. 1 John 4 and 5, what do we learn? God is love. And then we get the question, and actually, you know what? There was a major worship leader who just fell away from the faith and renounced his faith. Why? Because he said, well, nobody answers the tough questions. And you know what? How could a God of love send anybody to hell? Well, Jesus answered that question very clearly, didn't he? If you want a hell preacher, you know who the hell preacher was? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. You won't find it many other places in the scripture. It's Jesus who's the one who's warning us about hell. Yeah, the one who's warning us about judgment. And he comes and he says that I've come into the world for God so loved the world that I gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but receive eternal life. So it was the greatest gift given to all mankind. Jump two verses later on. But the judgment is this. Mankind loved the darkness rather than the light. So very clearly, if you read John 3, it's Nicodemus, the whole Nick at night thing, right? And it goes through. And how can a man be born again? Blah, blah, blah. All this stuff. And the point is, who is sending themselves to hell? The person. Because the judgment is this. Did God come into the world? Many times, guys. He finally sent his son, and does he continue to send his spirit and continue to send his true apostles and preachers and teachers and all the different giftings? Absolutely. Has God always revealed himself to mankind? All right, I love the story of Egypt. It says that his name might be known throughout the nations. He's always performing uh, miraculous signs, performing uh, signs that attest to who he is and his glory. And every single time, the majority of people, what do they do? Pass on by. And even worse, they even throw their fists up. They say, I don't want you. 
over and over and again because what? Wide and broad is the gate that leads to destruction. And this is a hard word. There are many. And could be very easy, like I said, when it comes to our friends and family and they don't know God. Well, you know what? Everyone will eventually be saved. And could we deceive ourselves? And could we go down that road? But is God just? Is God good? Can you eternally judge anybody? No, that is not our job. Who is the judge? The Lord. And in every situation, who do we need to trust? The just judge. The just judge that's right. And even in a situation where we don't know, do we have to leave it with the Lord? Amen. You have to leave it with the Lord. You'll wreck your head, guys. I tell you, you will. And you will eventually fall even away from the faith. Do you know most, uh, I might upset some people, I'm going to go for it, most Calvinists I've ever met are eternal security. If you don't know what this doctrine is, it's the belief that once you said the prayer or once you've really come to know God, you cannot fall away from the Lord. Well, I'm going to call rubbish because the scriptures say rubbish. Go look and read Hebrews very clearly over and over again. The Lord says, if you continue, if you hold fast, we have the choice. And Paul even says, or the writer of Hebrews even says, that if we've received and tasted of the things of the age that is to come, the Holy Spirit, and then turn away from the living God, he says it's impossible to come back through repentance. These are hard scriptures, guys. But the reality is, can people lose their salvation? Can people fall away from the living God? Did it happen all throughout the scriptures many times? Did it happen to the Hebrews? Did it happen to the first century church? It did. But what is the Lord warning us? To fight the good fight. To keep holding fast. To make sure that we are not the ones that give up on the race in the middle of the fight. But we keep going and we are strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. And where do we lead people to? The narrow gate. Because do you know the way? I know the way. Remember, what was it, Thomas? Was it, no, not Thomas. Was it Thomas? Yeah, Thomas asked the question. Lord, well, where are you going? We don't know the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Do you know that? I hope so. I look around this room and I see a lot of professing Christians. So if you know that, then what can we do? You can lead people to the gate. Now, I want to encourage you. You can't push people through the gate. <laughs> you can lead them there. That's my job. I'm a shepherd. And you, to a lesser extent, if you want to say, you guys are called to be shepherds as well. You're leaders. You are ambassadors for Christ Jesus. So can you lead people to the gate? Can you say, here's the gate. Here's the way to eternal life. Here's the good shepherd. Can you lead them there? But can you force them to go through? Can I force you to go through? And if I try to force you to go through, how will that turn out? <laughs> it usually arouses our rebellious nature. When someone tries to push somebody to do something, doesn't it? And then they even fight back and don't want to do it. But we can lead people to the gate. And can they meet the shepherd standing at the gate? Can they say, wow, yeah, that's Jesus. And I need to know my shepherd and give their life to him, so forth, so on. The Lord then continues on. So we need to make sure Jesus, the narrow gate, we are following us. I could just preach on this forever. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? We know this, right? Go try to pick some figs from a thistle bush. Let me know how it turns out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so every tree, right? Uh, so every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. This is very logical, isn't it? A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. So there are lots of things out there nowadays, especially in the church, just saying, love God and you'll be grand. Is that step one? Good step. Is there more? Did the Lord create us to then go on and produce fruit? All right. The Lord is very agricultural minded. So do you know when he brings somebody into his vineyard, into his field, into his house, guess what we are supposed to do? Work. <laughs> You're supposed to work for the kingdom, guys. Did you know that? That's not just my job. That's all of our jobs. 
Now, I might do it full time, and the Lord has called me this, but do you know you're called to be a hired hand in the service of the Lord? Do you guys know that? Okay. And will you receive wages? You will, guys. The Lord will reward you based on what you've done in this age, very clearly. Now, do we love the Lord on a works-based mentality? No. And don't go out of here, oh, I've got to work, and then I'll feel better. Or there's lots of people, you know, that go out, yeah, striving. And we say, you know what, well, I'll go out and I'll feed the poor, and I'll do all this stuff, and da-da-da. And is that stuff good? It can be accompanied by the gospel. But does it bring about your eternal salvation? No, only Christ does. But as we come into his kingdom, and as we love him, just like my little son comes to me and sees me doing a project, what's he want to do? He wants to help with the project. He wants to... Get <laughs> and do you know what? Would it be easier? God's God, guys. He can do whatever he wants. And could he just snap his fingers and everything be done? Do you believe that? I do, because it's very clear in Scripture. I am the Lord, and I change not. I am the Lord, and who can stand before me? What judge can call me? He goes through over and over again. Go read Job if you want the sovereignty of God. So could he snap his fingers? Boom, everything's done. But is he doing that? No, he's got a perfect plan. And who does he include in that plan? The children of God. He wants us to come into that place of relationship with him that he would then say, my son, here's the task I have for you. My son, here's the thing that when I created you, do you know when God created you, he created you with a specific purpose? Do you guys know that? And we need to then ask the Lord what that purpose is. I loved a couple years ago reading through the, st the story of Samuel and his mother, right? This amazing miracle child. What does she vow to do? Give them to the Lord. We know the story, right? But we always think that was an amazing stretch. You know what actually wasn't? Do you know what he was already given to before he was even born? He was a Levite. So get was, guess what his priest, uh, sorry, his role, his function was to do when he was born? Work for the household of God. And did his mother know this? So I want to encourage you parents. Do you know one of your greatest roles that God has given you is to find the callings and giftings of your children and usher them into those things, okay? As my kids grow, I see the things that they are inclined to. I'm talking about spiritual gifting. And then what do I do? I help them in that area. I say, okay, well, I see what God has called you to, and I will encourage you in that area. A very godly thing to do. So then it continues on. And the Lord very clearly says, we will know them by their fruits, right? Every tree uh, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you'll know them by their fruits. Now, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So whose will are we supposed to be doing? All right, the Father's will. Are we supposed to be doing our will? Who likes your will sometimes? <laughs> Now, if our will is subjected to the will of the Father, will good things come? My son, when he is in a good mood and he is subjected in obedience to me as the Father, do good things come? But does he have his own will? Does he have his own will? <laughs> and Ken, okay, like well, yesterday I was telling him, okay, do this with your mom. And what does he say? But dad, I, 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 and he wants to say what he has to say. And I said, no, listen. And he keeps trying to say, no, listen. And what is that? That's his will. He didn't want to hold his mother's hand. And he needed to hold his mother's hand because we were at the zoo. So he had to listen. So I had to sit there. And did I have to break his will? Does the father, do you need to let the father break your will? Ooh. And do you know some of us can be very strong-willed? I'm talking about our flesh, our sinful desires, our rebellious nature. All right? We need to make sure our will is His will. And as we come into that place, do you know what? Do we have a good Father, guys? Is our Father going to abuse us? Is our Father going to hurt us and put us in situations that will make us compromise our faith? And, but will He put us in tough situations? All right, a good, uh, yeah, thank you very much, I meant to do that. A good father, as the child grows, do they give them bigger tasks? And do they strengthen them and encourage them and prepare them for life? They do. 
So how much more so our heavenly father? So the Lord says really quick here, right? You will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, right? All of this will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say, this is, this is really uh, strong, guys. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice yeah, iniquity or lawlessness or wickedness or sin. Interchangeable, same thing. So the Lord... Does he say we will know them by their fruits? I know this is okay. This is where we, we want to say, oh, don't judge me, right? Remember we talked about that last week? We don't judge the world. Not our job to judge the world. The world does not know God. The world is accountable to God for their wickedness, but they do not know him. So all they know, as the scriptures say, uh, they are children of wrath, as were some of us, okay? We used to be there as well. But do we judge within the household of God? Very clearly, the scriptures are clear on this. Do we need to have a clean eye? Do we need the Lord to renew our heart? And do we need to make sure we're being led by the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But is the Lord here now saying very clearly, everybody who says they're a Christian is not a Christian? Let's interpret it modern day terminology. Is that what the Lord is saying? There are 2. Point what? 1 or 2.2 billion Christians supposed in the world. Are they all Christians? Real Christians? I'm sorry, it's not true. If it were true, the world would look very different, guys. Okay? America would still be great Christian America. Ireland would still be the land of saints and scholars. England would be thriving with the gospel that they sent out to all the world. But the reality is what has happened? Well, the influence of the world has gotten into the church. This anti-God, anti-Christ agenda. So the Lord very clearly does he say, we will know them by their, their fruits. Now it is not an excuse for you as a believer to go around and constantly pick on fellow believers and say, oh, I thought you were a Christian. You shouldn't say that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't. That's legalism. Because what does the scripture say? Love covers a multitude of sins. But if I have somebody in this church... And let's just say they're practicing adultery. And then they're saying, no, I love Jesus. I'm following God. Do we have a major problem? And I'm the pastor. These jobs aren't fun for me. I've got to go, and go to that person and say, you cannot practice this and be in the kingdom of God, let alone think you can stay in this church. Because Corinthians, we have situations like this. Does it affect the body? Does it then lower the standard of God? And is the Lord very clearly saying that no adulterer will inherit the kingdom of God? Fornicator, sexual sin. So in all these things, do we then need to profess the truth? And does the Lord then say, by the fruit, we will know them? So the fruit that is being produced in our own lives, do we need to examine it? Paul says that we are to judge ourselves. That we are to even test ourselves to see if we are in the faith. So do we need to... Now I'm not saying guys... This whole rubbish out there. One moment I'm saved. One moment I'm not saved. One moment, oh, I did the right thing. I came to church and I worshiped Jesus. The next moment, oh, I got angry and upset with my wife. And now if I died, I'd go to hell. Rubbish. Okay? But if we stop going to church, stop reading the Bible, stop spending time with the Lord, yeah, start having rows with the wife, and then start to go down a path, let's say, with that coworker you shouldn't be hanging out with, could you very easily go down a path of death? Very quickly it can happen. So we need to be aware of these things. And then unfortunately, we could go to Proverbs right now when it comes to sexual sin and adultery. Is there fruit that comes from that? And the Lord is very clear on that. Is there fruit that comes from greed? Do you know Paul says that many have pierced themselves and even wandered away from the faith because of greed? All right? So these things come in so quickly. So we need to be aware of it. And the Lord says, what's the point? That word is so important to us all. Those who practice, practice. Do we all sin? Do we all fall short of the glory of God? Now, there are sins that lead to death. And if we are doing those, those need to stop. But do we sin? Do we get upset with one another? Do we, okay, if we don't sin with our mouth, as uh, James says, then we're a perfect man. Do we sin with our mouth? Do we sin with our actions, with our deeds? Yes, we do. 
But do you turn back to the living God? Do you ask for his forgiveness? Do you come back and are reconciled to him? Then you are in a good place. And as you continue to do that, has anyone noticed the sins you used to do, you no longer do? The things that used to tempt you, no longer tempt you, and the Lord has rescued you from that, okay? So the point is those who practice. So if we are practicing such things, we need to make a new practice. And what do we need to practice? Walking by the Holy Spirit. Walking in the commands of Jesus. Spending time with one another in his house. Luke 6.45 says, The good man, and this is a little bit, this is added in to what we see in Luke. The good man under the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. And the evil man under the treasure brings forth what is evil. For what his mouth, from, sorry, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. So the fruit that's in us, where is it going to come out? Your mouth. If you're a bad tree, or we got to say the term, I don't know if it's good or not, bad egg. If, if you're a bad egg, what's going to come out of your mouth? Rot. Yeah, filth, disease. Because Jesus very clearly says, what's on the inside of us? Where is it going to come out of? It's going to come out of us. Now, if we have been sanctified and cleansed by the Lord and we know Jesus' teachings, let's say you're in a situation and somebody gets cancer and everyone else just saying, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. And you come into that situation, can you speak words of life? Out of the, what, the good man, what does he bring? Treasure. So can you bring the truth of Jesus into that situation? Maybe they don't know the Lord, or maybe they know the Lord, but they are in such turmoil, and you speak a scripture over them. You pray with them and encourage them, and all of a sudden, boom, that good treasure changes their life. All right, so this is what the power of what's inside of us, the fruit that comes is going to come out of us, guys. We need to make sure that we are producing good fruit. Matthew 7, 24 through 28. We're just about done with the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you, Lord. So we've gone through, again, if you didn't hear any of the previous messages, look on YouTube. We went through the whole thing, and Rachel did one before, and she's going to do another one next week. But we went through all the Sermon on the Mount. And it, Jesus ends it by saying, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them might be compared to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. What's the catch? Do you, can you just hear him? Do you know that all the world... The world, excuse me, has heard some words of Jesus. Do you know the world is accountable to God's law? Do you know that even our conscience testifies against us? Because when somebody who says, oh, no, I've never known Jesus, yet they know thou shalt not murder, has it been seared on their conscience because they learned it from God's law somewhere? And is it actually a testimony against them? It is. So the problem with most of us in the world just like here, this little boy playing a video game, right? And the dad's talking. Why don't you go? And out the other ear, what comes out? Blah, blah, blah. What's the phrase? In one ear and out the other. We read through the Sermon on the Mount, and many of you, I look, have been in church a long time, and that's a good thing. You've known the Lord for a while. But do you just ramble it off? Can we ramble off? Yeah, the, our Father. Can we ramble off, oh yeah, God cares for the birds, God cares for the grass. I know that, I know that. But all my financial trouble, can we do that very quickly? Yeah. So the question is, are we hearing it? And what does Jesus say? Acts on them. Do you know faith? Faith is not just believing God exists. Do you know what that is? Common sense. <laughs> Creation testifies there is a creator. Do you know what true faith is? Trusting God. True faith is saying, I heard your teachings. I heard what you said. And I choose to obey. I choose to take it. Not just let it go in one ear out the other, but allow it to go in my ear. And if it goes into your ear, where is it supposed to get into? Into your brain. And as your mind is renewed, where does it travel down to? The heart. And it becomes that foundation. And then out of that place, out of the heart, what comes? Good treasures. He who hears these words and acts on them, the wise man, right, who builds his house on the rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. All right. Good job, church. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and it slammed against the house. And yet it did not fall 
for it had been founded on the rock. All right. So there's another myth I'm going to shatter right now. Everyone thinks when we come to know Jesus, woohoo, everything's going to be grand, great, and wonderful. Do you know what Jesus actually said? When you come to know me, there's storms coming. <laughs> he said there's going to be hard times. I love the story of when they get into the boat and what happens? The storm comes. The storm didn't have to come, but the Lord allowed the storm to come so that his power might be made known to his disciples. So does the Lord bring storms? Read Job. <laughs> the Lord brings storms. All right? Does the Lord even bring what we would consider chaos or calamity? Go read Isaiah 45 and see what the Lord has to say to Cyrus. Okay? This is the Lord, and he does all these things. But if we are built on the rock, when the storm comes, will we fall? No, no we won't. Does it mean it's going to be easy? No. Could we have people curse and say all types of vile stuff against us? And remember what we read in Matthew 5? Jesus said we are blessed, right? But then we have the foolish man. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them is like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the flood came, the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell. And now this is a hard line, and great was its fall. Because they heard the words, but what? They did not put them into action, put them into practice. So they just were words. But we know as we receive those words, are they words of life? All right, Jesus says that if we take them and we receive them and we walk by his commandments, we will be blessed. We will be loved by our Father. Read John 14 and 15. It even says that the Father will disclose himself to us. This is an amazing thing, guys. When Jesus finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, and he was teaching them as one having authority, not as their scribes. So really quick, in Luke, we have the same thing. But Jesus, oof, man, Jesus gives a strong rebuke when we get the account in Luke. Because in Luke 6, 46, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Oof. Oof. Yeah. Why do you call me master, master? Absolutely. And do not obey me. Because what's the implication? He's not their master. They can go through the motions. And unfortunately, there are many people in the worldwide church that cry out, Jesus, Jesus. But then as soon as they walk out of the doors of the church, do they do what he says? Do we do what he says? You need to ask yourself that question. And it is a very hard rebuke from the Lord that if we do not do what he says... Are we truly his disciples? Are we what we've deemed this term Christian? If we are constantly doing the opposite of what the Lord says, do we have a major problem? We do. Because then what are we being led by? Are we being led by the Holy Spirit? No. You're being led by your flesh. You're being led by your will, your desires. But if we truly love God, who will be leading? Take my yoke... And my burdens. Who's driving the cart? Jesus. Who's put the yoke on us? Who's broken our flesh, our will? Jesus. Now, can we have tantrums? <laughs> can you kick? <laughs> can you give out and scream? But when the Lord then comes in his love and rebukes you, how do you respond? All right, one of the most testing things... Uh, for all of us, is can you take correction? Do you know all of us need to be corrected? Even myself. Do you know we can all be wrong? And do you know God has put people, authority, in this earth to correct us? Do you know a police officer is a great way of correction? And do you know who gave us the law? Civil law? God. So when the police officer pulls you over on the M50 because you were doing 140... And they say, okay, license. And you show it to them, and then they come back, give you a ticket. What does your flesh say? I wasn't going 140. I was going to go 130. This guy. <laughs> You're all laughing. <laughs> yeah, do you say, thank you, officer. Thank you for upholding the law and giving me a ticket and giving me a point. <laughs> do you do that? <laughs> we got a couple honest people. 
because it goes against our flesh. And that's what God has given us, his commands, his law, his way for, is that as these things come in, he teaches us his way. And we have a choice then to what? Hear his words, and if we then hear them and abide in them, we will be wise. Who here wants wisdom? So how do you receive wisdom? By obeying the wise teacher's commands. Yeah, that's exactly it. And if we don't obey his commands, will you be wise or will you be a fool? You'll actually be a fool. Does the Lord want us to be fools, spiritual fools? No. no. He wants us to be wise and he wants us to be built on the rock. All right, so I have this picture. We're going to end with this analogy. All right, really quick. We get a little more information in Luke. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts to them, I will show him whom he is like. He's like a man building a house. So is this a little bit different? who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood occurred and the torrents burst against the house uh, and could not shake it because it had been well built. All right, my dad is a stonemason. This is my father and my mother, brother and sister-in-law and all their kids. Everybody come greet them afterwards. And my dad, okay, for many years, he worked in masonry. How many foundations have you laid, dad? <laughs> Lots. And what do you have to do to lay a foundation? Dig down. All right. What did the Lord say? I think there's a great analogy in this. The wise man is like, does it take effort and work in our walk with the Lord? Do you actually have to dig down? And as you start digging down, what do you find? Maybe a rock. Maybe, oh, maybe there's an electrical line there. <laughs> maybe there's a gas main that you're going to have to work around and move. <laughs> a water pipe that bursts. Yeah. Yeah. You find out it's full of clay and there's all water and you, oh no, I can't, how are we going to deal with this foundation? We've got to put in some drainage. Yeah. All right, the silly analogy, what's the point? Does the Lord say we have to dig down? Yeah. And I don't know about you, I've noticed in my walk with the Lord, there has been lots of work. Because do you know what I am? I am an imperfect man. But I serve a perfect Savior who loves me and has chosen me. And in that perf imperfect state... Do I have to put in the effort and work? And do I have to dig down and say, Lord, okay, I want you as my foundation. And anything else that is not you. Do you know we can have other things we've built up that are not Jesus? Do you know Paul talks about that? That we can have the foundation of the Lord, but do you know we can build on top of it with rubbish? With the wood, the hay, and the stubble? And he says they will actually suffer loss. Because what happens? It has to be tested by the fire and it's burnt up. So if there's anything we've built with that is not precious, that is not the kingdom of God, do you, did you guys know sometimes you have to do some demolition? <laughs> Bear with the analogy. Sometimes we've built something, we've got a nice little thing in the corner. It even looks very Christian. But then we look at it and we go, wait a minute, that looks like God, but that's not God. That's something else. And then what does the Lord give you? He's the foreman and he comes in and he says, here's a sledgehammer. <laughs> and he comes along and does he take it down with you has he given us the holy spirit which is the helper absolutely that's not by our own efforts our own strengths that we need to do it all but is he there with us is he there helping us encouraging us on he's the god you know what i love the name in romans it says he's the god of endurance god knows we need endurance guys god knows we need to be strengthened to keep fighting the good fight to keep running the race so, are you going to be the wise man who builds upon the rock, who digs down into the soil, lays the good foundation, and builds on Jesus? I hope so. So, as we continue on, Rachel's going to get into it next week, uh, just looking at more Christian conduct and etiquette, how we are to conduct ourselves in the house of God, how we are supposed to act as believers. Let's stand up. In John 3, 19 through 21, the verdict is this. The light has come into the world, but the people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light for the fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth, who is the truth? Jesus. Comes into the light so it might be seen as plainly what has been done in the sight of God. So where are we supposed to come into? The light. Who's the light? And in the light, if he wants to expose something, if he wants to show us that mold spot, 
That thing that we've built that needs to be torn down, whatever the issue may be, do we need to give it to him? And do we need to allow him to work in that area? And just like I put this up before, you know what? Some of these words, all of these words, Jesus' words, do they cut to our heart? Do they come against our sinful nature and our flesh? And all of you, you know what? Could you do this? Any of us, could we do this? A reassuring lie, an inconvenient truth. Could you deceive yourself? Could you say, well, you know what? Those teachings, they're grand, but I'm under grace. I don't need to follow any of them. And would you be deceived? You would. Because who is grace? The Lord. Jesus is grace. And if we don't follow his teachings, can we be under his grace? We've got a contradiction, don't we? So as we come today, as we read these things, let that them again sink into us. Let's be a people in love, on fire with the Lord, built on the rock, producing good fruit for the kingdom of God and for his will and his righteousness. So Lord Jesus, we thank you again that you are our rabbi, the head teacher. Lord, that you care for us, that you love us, that you sat, Lord, and you lowered yourself uh, even below the angels for that time, that you might come and reveal yourself to us, mankind, your creation. So, Lord, we thank you again for these teachings. We thank you, Lord, that your words are life. Your words are the truth. Your words, Lord God, as we take them and we make them our home, they are the secure foundation that when the storm comes, the, the wind blows, it gives way, Lord God, we thank you that we will not fall because we have been built on you. And Lord Jesus, in this place, if there's anything we've built other than you, may we tear it down today. Lord, if there's any idolatry, any high places that have been raised up in anyone's life, may they be taken out this day. Whether it be spiritual, Lord, whether it be idols and, and demonic things that can come in, or Lord, whether it be lust or greed, Lord, whether it be the flesh and all the desires of this age, if there's anything we've built up today, may we tear that thing down and may we come and allow you to build within us with precious materials, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that you teach us we are being built in to a dwelling place for you, the Lord God Almighty, and your spirit. So we just ask today, Lord, you say, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking for your Holy Spirit. And it will be given to us in a greater measure, Lord. So we ask for more of your spirit today in this place. May each one of us cry out from our heart in that place and receive more from you, and keep coming to you in intimacy and relationship. And we thank you, Lord, for what you will do in each one of our lives. Amen.